it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the panel, uh, Janae Khan. Um, Janae writes and speak, speaks about online teaching and learning for international audiences, which is similar to our audience. Our audience is quite international. She is the executive director uh, of the Center for Teaching and Learning at uh, UC Berkeley and held prior roles at uh, California State University, Sacramento, Stanford University, and UC Davis. Anybody from those institutions can um, can be happy. Uh, she has designed resources for teachers, facilitators, and coaches on ways to improve learning engagement, and is a frequent contributor to the Chronicle of Higher Education, Faculty Focus, and other publications dedicated to teaching and learning. She is uh, the author of two books, uh, Design for Learning, User Experience in Online Teaching and Learning, and uh, Scheme Dive Surface, Teaching Digital Reading. Uh, recently published. Uh, Janae, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to have you at the symposium, and I'll turn it over to you to, to introduce the panel. Great. We, uh, we probably need, yeah. Right you can use this one. Oh, okay. I guess we can share. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction, Igor, and thank you to all the organizers for this really wonderful symposium. It's my first time here, so I'm delighted to get to meet many new colleagues and reacquaint myself with uh, colleagues I've already met and generate some really great ideas. And this, of course, is such a hot topic, so I have no doubt we're going to have a really vibrant conversation. So it's my pleasure, first I'll introduce the members of our panel, um, just to give you a sense of what to expect once the panelists have been introduced and you're gonna be floored by their range of expertise. Um, I'll ask them several questions, four questions to be exact, time allowing. We should have some time kind of towards the end for your questions, so as you're listening, I do encourage you to take note of questions you may have. Oh, thank you. So we won't have to share a mic after all. We can each have our own special mic. Um, so you should have some time to engage with questions as they might be coming up for you as you're listening. And we'll end with each of the panelists providing a brief recommendation for further reading or resources that might help you keep thinking about this ever-evolving and vibrant topic. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Scott Adler, to my left, is the Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School and Professor of Political Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Prior to becoming dean, Scott served as chair of the political science department and was founding director of the department's American Politics Research Lab. He has also served as director of the Center to Advance Research and Teaching in the Social Sciences from 2016 to 18. Scott's scholarly research uses theoretical methods of legislative organization to examine congressional agenda setting and committee power. He is the author of Why Congressional Reforms Fail, Re-election in the House Committee System, which was awarded the Alan Rosenthal Prize from the Legislative Studies Section of the American Political Science Association. This might just go out. No, okay, we're good. And Congress and the Politics of Problem Solving. He is co-editor of Macro Politics of Congress. His most recent book, The U.S. Congress, is a widely used textbook for students of uh, Congress. Scott received his doctoral and master's degrees in political science from Columbia University and his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Michigan. He has been at the University of Colorado since 1996. To the left of Scott is Andreas Breiter. Uh, professor, Dr. Andreas Breiter is a full professor for information management and educational technologies at the University of Bremen in Germany. He is the scientific director of the Institute for Information Management Bremen a member of the Department of Mathematics and Informatics, the Center for Media, Communication, and Information Research, and co-lead of the university's Data Science Center. He studied sociology and computer science at the Gotha University in Frankfurt and the University of Southampton in the UK, and received his PhD in engineering from the University of Bremen in 2000. Between 2015 and 2020, he was vice president for research and responsible for early career research and development of the university, and since the last three years, he serves as chief digital officer. His research work is focused on socio-technical processes of mediatization, datification, and organizational change within educational systems. He has done several comparative studies on data literacy and media education in K-12 schools, as well as in higher education institutions. Currently, he is PI in research and implementation projects on AI in higher education, addressing risks and opportunities of AI in teaching and learning, learning management, and student services. He has published extensively in journals, books, and conference proceedings, the latest books on the datification of schools in Germany. 
And to the left of Dr. Andreas Breiter is Camille Crittenden, PhD. She's the executive director of Citrus and the Bonitao Institute and co-founder of the Citrus Policy Lab and the EDGE Expanding Diversity and Gender Equity in Tech Initiative at UC. She also served as chair of the California Blockchain Working Group in 2019 to 2020 and co-chaired the Student Experience Subcommittee of the UC Presidential Working Group on Responsible AI in 2021. She currently serves as co-chair of the Education Outcome Area Working Group for developing California's digital equity plan under the California Department of Technology. Prior to coming to Citrus in 2012, she was executive director of the Human Rights Center at Berkeley Law, where she helped to develop its program in human rights, technology, and new media. She had written and spoken widely on these topics, as well as technology applications for civic engagement, government transparency and accountability, and the digital divide. She held positions as Assistant Dean for Development with International and Area Studies at UC Berkeley and in Development and Public Relations at University of California Press and San Francisco Opera. She earned an MA and PhD from Duke University. And finally, at the very end of our table here, we have uh, Dr. Zach Pardos. Dr. Pardos is an Associate Professor of Education at UC Berkeley, studying adaptive learning and AI. For the past 10 years, his research centered around designing human AI collaborations uh, to pave pathways to and within systems of higher education, um, which has been published in venues such as SIGCHI, the Internet and Higher Education, AAAI, and Science. This work has included the development of high quality tools used by tens of thousands of students and administrators, including transfer planning, course articulation, and course recommend recommender systems, such as askoski.com, as well as a recently released open source tutoring system. At Cal, Dr. Pardos directs the computational approaches to human learning research lab, teaches in the undergraduate data science major, and is a faculty affiliate in cognitive science. Whoa, that's a lot of accomplishments across this panel. So we have quite the group. I'm going to switch mics for a moment to give this over to Dr. Adler. That way everyone can speak with their own mic here. Yes, back to you. All right. There we go. Never mind, we're going to keep sharing. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with our first question here, and I will just have each panelist sort of go down the row and answer it in order. Um, and again, we should have some time for some dynamic kind of cross conversation um, in a few minutes. So the first question is What developments in AI do you think will have the biggest impact on student experience as we know it today, and why? And I'm going to have Dr. Adler kick us off. Thank you. Um, so I will uh, forego with the joke that ChatGPT wrote my responses, as I'm sure we've all heard before. Uh, and I, I think I want to give a little bit of a qualification. I'm, as you heard the introductions, I'm not really an expert on AI at all. Um, I, I, however, have spent quite a bit of time thinking about um, the implications of AI for higher education, being a, in higher education leadership, and also thinking about the policies that we are creating for our universities and, and what that means for the, the, the structure of uh, the higher education experience for our students. Um, the other thing, so one thing I want to kind of put aside for the moment is the question about policies regarding cheating or using chatbots to write uh, answers for students on, in their coursework. I, I, I think we've already seen that all of us are relatively slow in reacting to this because it's actually quite a complicated matter. It's not simply as easy as saying, well, students are using chatbots to um, write their responses to an essay question, and therefore that's plagiarism, and we're going to call that cheating, because it becomes much more complicated than that. Um, it's pretty straightforward when we're thinking about, say, uh, um, writing a term paper on um, how political polarization affects congressional elections, my field in political science. But if, we're, if a student is using um, uh, an AI, AI like ChatGPT to write it, our code for doing statistical analysis in a data science class, it's not so clear that that is going to be cheating, right? I, I actually think that that is a 
relatively, I don't know, want to say straightforward, but a minor question on what effect AI is going to have for students. And I really, as I was thinking about this, wanted to focus on two things that I think are going to be quite substantial. Um, the first are thinking about really our jobs. Um, and I, I, I think that AI is going to change the, the field of higher education, like every other field as well, very, very quickly. So some of the mundane tasks and even some of the not so mundane tasks are going to be made more efficient and easier through AI. Some of the jobs are, are going to go away and our jobs are going to change. So the things that we do in a university, degree audits, um, processing admissions applications, facilitating registration, writing communications, and a lot of the work that many of us do in here, data work, that's going to change profoundly. Um, you know, and I think of an example on this. Uh, uh, I, I wanted um, a list of donors to the graduate school from our development folks. It took two months and two meetings with four different people to get something that I'm fairly certain in very short order, uh, it will take no longer than um, the amount of time it, for me to describe it to a AI data bot to return those data to me. I mean, that's going to be made much more simple. Now, does that mean less jobs for the data folks? Probably not, but maybe different jobs for the data folks. That's not unique to higher education. I think the, the change that will be very unique for higher education is that our disciplines are going to change. Um, we are going to see very different, frankly, academic departments. I had a dean of the College of, uh, College of Engineering tell me that in less than 10 years, he believes that the Department of Computer Science will not exist in the form that it does now. And I don't think that that's the only department that's going to be like that. Now, there are going to be some some that come to our minds immediately, um, data science, statistics, finance, they're going to be transformed as well. But I also think law, physics, history, political science, the way we teach students, the way the skills that students have to have, the knowledge that's created from AI, that is going to be transformative. And I think that we're going to have to adjust to that, that change, we as an institution of higher ed and, and our institutions, and I, I'll, I'll be blunt, we're, we're not known for being nimble. We're not known for being an institution that changes very quickly. And I think we're going to have to adjust to that because AI learns much faster than humans, and that means that this is coming like a freight train, and, and, and we're going to need to adjust to that. One of the implications, I think, for this group is that we're going to need data. We're going to need to understand what this means for our students. And that's where Siru comes in, because that has been an extremely useful and timely source of information about the student experience. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Dr. Breiter, what are your thoughts on uh, the biggest developments in AI, or what the biggest impact that um, we'll have on student experience with AI? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, I just want to repeat to Scott's idea that um, the universities will change dramatically. I doubt it. I'm uh, being a sociologist by training. I compare these kind of institutions as being very, very conservative. Um, and resistance to change, um, and that's us too. And maybe I'm from a country with a very long tradition of universities, and we compare them to uh, other institutions that don't change so dramatically. One is uh, prisons, um, and the other is the Catholic Church. So just think about that. Um, but there's still some change, of course, going on, and I think uh, AI, um, and I don't want to point to ChatGPT because I think that's overrated, um, I think, and that's what we're developing and, and working on, is to support individual student learning. 
And this is uh, an informative assessment. So there are many components to it. So one is individualized learning. That's not new. I don't know how long that's around in learning sciences. And formative assessments are also not new. But with AI technology, you can tailor uh, it far more to the individual student's experience. And that will change the learning experience, hopefully. Um, there is some ev evidence. And I think Zach's one of the guys who's doing a lot of research on that. Um, so I think that will be the, the biggest change. And to think about multimodal um, a learning experience, so not only text-based, but uh, in the different sciences, it will be on graphics, photos, and, and, um, and, and videos. So that's one thing. The second is, by thinking about that, it will change, and that's what we see in our institutions, it changed how we think about assessment. Because the way we do it traditionally, maybe Germany is unique in that, is very boring. Um, and we know that doesn't work. And Things like ChatGBT, but all the other things, just like Google, um, changed it, and we still do the same boring exams. That's not competence-oriented assessment. That's old-fashioned. Um, and um, so I think that's, that is a trigger, and we, we're working with our professors to think about the assessment. So that's a side effect which is very helpful um, and should have been done 30 years ago, I would say. Um, and the last, um, what I want to point out is, um, what it changes is uh, we have to reform our curricula in all subjects to critical thinking on AI. And that requires that we know about AI, but we are also able well, to use it responsibly um, um, and responsibly. And um, also, um, well, because that's the next generation in all the subjects that will build the AIs, systems that will use them as whatever managers, executives, wherever they will work, academics. Um, so that will be sort of have a cross-cutting curriculum um, with, let's say, critical AI thinking. Thank you, Dr. Bider. Dr. Crittenden, what are your thoughts on impacts to student experience? Yeah, thank you. Um, so in Janae's nice introduction, uh, I just wanted to spell out the acronym for Citrus because there are so many acronyms uh, in our world. That's the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society. So we're really looking at that cross-cutting um, intersection between emerging information technology research and how can it be uh, socially beneficial. So I started working on this topic a while ago and participated, as Janae said, in this um, UCOP presidential working group to develop guidelines around responsible AI. That project had four areas that a subcommittee from um, faculty members and staff from across the university were looking at applications in, a, in um, HR, in policing, in health, and in the student experience. So I was co-chair of the student experience one and really uh, got a lot out of looking at a variety of applications. We stayed away for the most part from looking specifically at classroom applications and AI research. So I'm very glad to have colleagues here on the panel who can speak you know, with great uh, experience and depth to the classroom and pedagogical implications of AI. What I want to contribute right now is just two points around other aspects of the student experience where I think AI could play a role and maybe you all have um, discussions about these areas with colleagues on your campuses. One is in admissions and retention. So at the University of California, you probably know hundreds of thousands of high school students apply for admission to a UC campus. Um, and these admissions offices, for the most part, still handle each of those individually, reading them at least twice, I think, in most cases. Um, but eventually, it will come to a point where I think AI could be quite helpful in at least winnowing down, you know, these folks are definitely not meeting the standards that we want to apply. These folks perhaps are definitely yes. And then that can make a, a smaller subset that the individual um, admissions officers can look at. So I, I imagine that there are programs already out there. I've had a few discussions with some admissions officials, and they, you know, continue to in insist that it's all, uh, you know, personally hand read. Um, um, but I could imagine a day uh, that, there, that that would um, come in handy. The other place for the admissions and um, enrollment kind of activity is in retention, particularly after students have registered their intent, their intent to register. That's what it's called at California. In the spring, when they get an offer admission, they say, yes, I'm going to come to UC. And then usually 8 to 10 percent of those students don't show up in the fall. So some applications, if you get them enrolled with a chat bot, and of course most 
17, 18 year olds, um, it, the interface is gonna be the mobile, right? It's gonna be their texting. Um, so chatbots can be helpful to say, hey, have you submitted this form? Um, if you haven't yet submitted your financial aid form, you need to do that. Did you know that there's an opening welcome orientation at such and such a date? So you know, like all those steps along the way to help reduce what uh, is called summer melt. You might have heard that word, where people um, intend to enroll, but then some don't show up. So I think some of those AI applications can be helpful there. Um, I'll leave that point there, but one other point that I wanted to make where I think AI could be helpful in the student experiences around mental health. So um, that can also be useful with appropriate cautions around privacy and, you know, like ill, badly implemented uh, mental health applications, which we've also heard about. But there have been cases, especially in COVID, in these times of real social isolation, where students uh, who are enrolled and you know have said, yes, I would like to be, you know, interact with this bot around uh, counseling or around things that I need. It could be just like, I'm sick, I need to have someone bring me something to eat to my dorm room. Um, but it could also be, you know, look, I'm feeling really sad and depressed. Um, and then the bot can reply and escalate to humans as needed um, based on certain triggering keywords. Um, so those kinds of applications, I think, have a lot of possibility, again, in very large institutions, perhaps, where there are students coming from any number of backgrounds, students who speak a different language, perhaps, than the primary language spoken on campus. These bots are available 24-7, um, where real live mental health staff are not. Uh, and so I think it could be used as a supplementary tool to help students get access to assistance that they might need. And Studies show that students actually like, in many cases, interacting with the bot. Like they might, they feel less inhibited sometimes in typing in their question that they might think is embarrassing, um, and when they know it's not a human necessarily sitting right behind it, but that they can get some level of information um, from this automated tool. So I'll leave that there. Thank you, Dr. Crittenden. Dr. Pardis, what are your thoughts on developments and their impacts? Uh, yeah. So. I'll Whenever you see AI, you can usually replace that with ChatGPT, and that's the title of uh, what's going on. And so I'll also speak to ChatGPT. Um, I'll also sidestep the conversation about cheating. Um, you know, search engines, like the point was already made, um, pose a cheating threat, um, but that hasn't changed much. Uh, what I do think uh, is a difference between search engines and ChatGPT when it comes to learning uh, is that ChatGPT can provide feedback. Um, and the, the computer and human tutoring literature has um, time and time again shown the benefit of immediate feedback when it comes to Socratic method, um, getting feedback on assignments immediately and so forth. So I, I think the big picture is that we'll see students throughout K-12 using ChatGPT in its raw discursive form to ask questions and get answers about things and maybe do knowledge checks. I think the impact on the university of ChatGPT throughout the pipeline of K-12 education is that now humans and students in that, um, who are humans um, will have at their disposal a kind of tutor that has seen everything that's on the internet. So what I think that means for us when they come to our research universities is they're gonna be more interested in going past that state of knowledge that was on the internet that they could ask a bot for. And so maybe a suggestion I would give to research institutions is make sure you have a robust um, undergraduate research program where uh, undergraduates can get involved in asking questions that ChatGPT can't answer. They may be more interested in that as time goes on. I'll get a little bit more granular. Um, my lab has done some work in kind of uh, evaluating claims about the usefulness of ChatGPT for education. Um, so for example, we've had ChatGPT generate hint messages within algebra um, within the context of a computer tutoring system. So we've replaced the human tutor hints with ChatGPT hints and then done an A-B test to see what's the difference in pretest scores of learning. Um, and uh, in algebra, it did turn out that uh, ChatGPT is statistically indistinguishable in terms of learning gains from the human hints in, in algebra, um, but that the hints that were produced by ChatGPT uh, errored 30% of the time. So we had to get rid of those hints before we exposed them to participants in the study. So right now, ChatGPT doesn't look like it's better than you know, a C minus student when it comes uh, to tutoring without mitigating techniques and without the next version being released yet. 
Thank you. I appreciate the range of thoughts here on everything from admissions and campus policies to classroom practice and sort of strategies for supporting undergraduate student development. We're going to get to some more concrete strategies with this next question, and we'll follow the same format of just moving down the table after each panelist. Um, so the second question is, what are some concrete ways that educators and administrators are, who are here attending today's event can evolve their practices to consider the potential impacts of AI on the student experience? So we'll start with Dr. Adler again. So I'm going to keep this brief, but uh, I, I sort of focused here on the people in this room. Um, you, you've heard already about many ways in which our students interact um, with AI in, in very different forms in, and in different places in, from the admissions process all the way through to their really hands-on, their, their coursework. And I think we, the, the CIRU community, needs to start thinking about how we gauge that through these surveys um, so that we understand better what that looks like from the student's perspective. And hopefully, um, it's going to inform the kinds of policy decisions that we have. We're going to need some da good data, and it's going to need to be broad data. And I think we need to be very considerate of, um, about what specific questions we're going to ask because, of course, this, the experience, the student interaction experience with AI differs quite a bit from campus to campus, but that's part of the advantage of being in this consortium is that we can learn from one another and we can hear about that, how that experience goes for students. Um, but CIRU is really critical for understanding that student, the student angle on this. Thank you. Dr. Bider, what are your thoughts? Well, I fully agree, so that would be a perfect thing. And um, to, ex to exchange ideas and experiences between the universities, particularly in the different university systems, because when I, when I heard Camille about uh, uh, what, what are the, the practices and, and usefulness, I would say a no-go in Germany and in Europe, a no-go. Mental health issues, admission, retention, absolutely no-go. Don't even think about that. Um, and what are the reasons we can discuss, maybe not in this panel, but later um, over coffee. Um, it's a totally different culture towards privacy data and the use of data. That's why I try to implement Zero in my institution. It was a very hard, well, Igor and John know that, a very hard uh, challenge. Um, and I wasn't successful. Um, so so that's, a, a, that's a different culture. What I think um, would be interesting to learn and to, to share here is how to bring AI in this general term, and like, like the UC system did, in sort of a code of good conduct and to have some sort of an organizational, what we call organization embedding, changing the culture to think about that. And that's much harder than to do pilot studies. I mean, that's wonderful. You can do perfect research about it, but to implement that in a university system is a very different story um, with across all the disciplines. And our experience is um, that um, you need to, well, to have an involvement strategy, an engagement strategy um, for all the stakeholders in the university. That sounds simple, <laughs> um, but it's hard to do. Um, um, in, in Germany and all over Europe, um, staff councils, uh, the unions are incredibly important. Um, in our university, they stopped all AI activities just by that. And they are allowed to do that legally. Um, now we have to think a way around that. Um, we can do it in research, but not in implementing. Um, and um, so, and also involve sort of teachers, professors to, to rethink their assessment strategies. And that's also a longer process. Uh, you can't just turn it around. Maybe younger um, staff we are hiring know more about that, but I doubt it, to be honest. So, so that's a longer uh, change. And the last thing we learned, at least, uh, we have a large project with five um, German universities on implementing AI technologies in the, in the universities on a broad range, about 200,000 students altogether. Um, and uh, one thing was don't trust the AI developers, particularly not big tech. Um, they will tell you everything um, they think they can do, but the systems are still in their infancy. I appreciate you're anticipating our question about ethics, Dr. Breiter, <laughs> that we'll get to next, which will be, I think, 
interesting to continue unpacking. Uh, Dr. Crittenden, what are your thoughts on some concrete ways folks in this room can evolve their practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just build on what has been said already, and I think this multi-stakeholder engagement is really important. So looking, for instance, at this UCOP, the Presidential Working Group on Responsible AI, it had faculty members and staff and leaders from all of the campuses. I would even broaden that when you're talking about specific instances to include students, to include anyone who's going to be um, touched by the AI. And I want to say that I'm not being cavalier about student privacy and <laughs> data protection and all of that. Um, I just don't want to be entirely negative about the opportunities that um, AI might afford us. Um, Oh, one other idea was around digital literacy, just in general, like helping students, and this probably has to happen even before they arrive at our university doors, um, to help them become better, uh, Zach, I think you were kind of indicating, like better consumers, more critical thinkers about how they are interacting with some of these tools like generative AI, because they inevitably will. You know, so we just need to be um, better about helping them understand what are what are they asking, what are the results they're getting, how can they double check that it's true or not true, um, and one other related recommendation could be to develop some standards around digital literacy. Like, what are we expecting students to know? Are there things that we can do here at the university to help develop and implement standards around um, understanding AI and generative AI and other tools? Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Critton. And Dr. Pardos, what are your thoughts on some concrete strategies this folks in this room might think about? Yeah, well, I, I share the um, assessment that Andreas says that the vendors are not up, uh, up to speed yet. So I'll, I'll start with what I hope will soon <laughs> uh, be eight concrete things that institutions can do. And w one is around uh, acknowledgement of prior learning. Uh, in transfer uh, um, with transfer students and other situations um, and I think uh, AI can help us evaluate the learning experiences that someone comes into that may um, either not be conventional maybe it's military service maybe it's after school programs um, or maybe it is more conventional like it's a course but our articulations aren't very up to date um, so my lab is collaborating with um, some elements of the California Community College system with uh, State University of New York um, to offer kind of data assistive algorithmic articulation recommendations. So it's still a humanistic process of certifying those articulations. Faculty often have to approve them or they give authority to staff sometimes to approve intro courses. But there's a real lack of articulation, a real lack of acknowledgement of prior learning. And this is a non-chat GPT thing. AI can, looks like it really can be used to help create more pathways into the research university from the community colleges. Um, the other thing would be um, simplifying the path to degree. This is a very high cognitive load task, maybe the highest cognitive load task you'll do in your life. And uh, AI can be used to help satisfy those rules, help you know, decrease the um, um, complexity of that process. I'd also encourage us as faculty to just decrease the complexity with which we describe a degree. Um, but that's a, that's a really hard problem. Um, OK, so but concretely, what can you be doing right now? Um, you can be getting ready to face those salespeople, you know, those vendors. What's your checklist, right? What do you want to make sure they have? Do you want them, uh, you know, is their approach replacing FTE or is it a collaboration technology and existing FTE? Have they thought about that collaboration? What technology underlies what they're doing? M most of the higher ed vendors, they're not inventing technology. They're not inventing AI. So, you know, get them to tell you what they're using because uh, then it inherits any limitations that's well known in the field about that technology. Are they transparent? Do they um, have evaluations of the performance of the technology? So just be savvy um, consumers. Thank you. I'm hearing lots of common threads. The one that stands out to me the most is the need for greater collaboration <laughs> across the institution, right, and creating much more nimble pathways for dialogue around shared uh, questions we'll all need to kind of tackle um, as we consider what it looks like to really implement or resist, in some cases, um, using this technology meaningfully. Um, Again, I think you all have actually anticipated really many ways this next question. Um, I think this might actually be our last question, so I want to make sure there's ample time for um, the audience to ask questions as they see that. But I've got one in my back pocket if we're feeling quiet. So rest assured, <laughs> I just wanted to give you a chance to think about your questions um, if you have them. 
So I'm wondering how we address the potential concerns with equity, ethics, and representation that likely result from increased usage of and developments in AI. So again, I'll pass this to Dr. Adler to kick us off. So I, I again, I put on my university administrator hat on this one. And um, I think right now, and, and I'm possibly sort of giving you insights into what's happening on my campus. There's a lot of time being spent thinking about, um, one, our policy on cheating and chat GPT, and that, that's sucking up a lot of our time and energy. And then the other is investing in AI as a disciplinary field. But I think something that is, I know some research is going on on our campus, I'm sure, I'm sure that it is on all of your campuses as well, but it's much less emphasized, which is the ethics of it. And I think as a university administrators, we need to start focusing on the places, the interface between um, all of this new technology that's coming at us very, very quickly and forcing us to do to uh, address it very quickly, but also, but not to lose sight of the fact that it has implications both in the way AI is being developed and in the ways it's being deployed, that we, we need to be spending as much time considering that as a, as a research area. So I, I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking to myself as an administrator, that we need to be focusing on that and, and investing in it as well. Thank you. What are your thoughts, Dr. Breider, on ethics? Well, I, I could spend the whole um, um, afternoon and the next uh, couple of weeks on, on ethics uh, of AI because it's, it's a very complicated field, of course, and it's very sort of cultural, culturally determined. Um, as I just mentioned that, um, I can't speak for Europe. Um, I might speak a little bit about Germany, but even then, we have 16 different privacy laws in Germany um, for 16 different federal states. Um, and a university is a state a institution, so in 16 states you have 16 different laws on privacy, uh, which universities have to follow. So that, that's a long story, but I think um, three, three parts. One, um, we have to think about side effects. Um, so, uh, and that's complicated, and that's, and that's part of a, let's say, sociological research about uh, what are side effects and impacts of any type of technology, uh, which we haven't encountered so far. So uh, think, and that's something we can use by exchanging experience um, between universities. The solutions we see are twofold. One is technology, um, and that's very common in our societies to use technology to solve problems we have with technology. Just uh, think about nuclear energy, etc. Um, so we have um, approaches like explainable AI, transparent AI, differential privacy. So these are algorithms that should help us to understand what the algorithms are doing. So that's definitely one area, and there's a lot of research going on, and I think that's important. And the second is more institutional. So it's about governance, it's about uh, rules and regulations, um, a code of good conduct, um, same, same type of things. So to, to, to have a, a common ethical understanding about what you want and what is far more difficult, what you don't want. So where, is, where do you want to stop it? Uh, what is sort of the intention, your strategy as a university of using technology and now AI in particular um, across um, the institution? We've experienced uh, in, a, in a large European project um, um, some sort of a ethical framework, which is very similar to what the UC uh, system has, some sort of a guideline um, of um, ethical use of AI, and uh, tested that across, I think, altogether 15 European uh, universities, um, and that can help um, and to, to create something like a, a data culture or a, a common understanding about ethical issues. But that will never end. We wait for the next technology to come. Thank you, Dr. Crittenden. How do you think we should respond to concerns with ethics, equity? Yeah, thank you. Um, one would be, as Zach alluded to, is in talking to the vendors um, and making sure that our CIOs and our CTOs really know what questions to ask about risk management around AI because for the most part, as far as it's being implemented across the university, we're not creating it. We're hiring it out. So we need to know like what 
standards they have, what kind of risk assessment framework do they have, what kind of auditing processes do they have in place to make sure that it's being deployed in an effective and um, fair, transparent, et cetera, kind of way. Around um, thinking about the data sets themselves that are training these AI models, also thinking about how well do they represent the population or the set of data that you want to represent, and helping students also, if they're computer science majors or data science majors, also to understand that and to be able to interrogate the data, data sets and the, the training sets that these algorithms are using so that you're not reproducing or reinscribing inequities as you're generating them through the algorithms. Um, and finally, I just wanted to make a plug actually for the positive side of the potential for increasing equity um, with these AI systems. And one way that that might look is that students who might not um, have here in the USA English as their first language, that they can, it does a good job for the most part of translating. So translating from one language to another, if you have, you know, scientific insights, say, that you want to share, but you're not writing in the language of the journal that you want to publish in, then this uh, tool can be useful in translating into um, not only another language, but also in some cases another register. I don't know if you've played around with ChatGPT, but you can tell it to say, you know, give me this information in the form of a poem. Give me this information in the form of an abstract that would be publishable in science. You know, so you can have it adopt the rhetorical style of a number of different um, publications. So in that way, people who might not have come from backgrounds where they're already well versed in some of these tools and um, you know, language of the uh, publications that they want to, to make their ideas known in, that this can be a positive tool for increasing equity and representation. Wonderful. Finally, Dr. Pardos, what do you think? Yeah, I'll echo the uh, issue of the representation of the data. You know, um, I went on a, a little tour in Israel to give talks at several Israeli um, institutions on an open, uh, open source tutoring system that we just released. And uh, a question that I got that I hadn't got before was, uh, do you have the materials available in Hebrew? Oh, I really should have thought about that before I gave a talk to a bunch of um, uh, Hebrew-speaking uh, universities. And so translation is a big deal. And it turns out the language models like ChatGPT, I, I didn't know this before, but apparently they're notoriously bad in Hebrew. Um, so th that will be an issue for um, in terms of the how performant these models are for um, different people. Uh, the good news is that F fairness uh, and is a pretty hot field within computer science, and so there are established techniques to sort of de-bias models. Um, we've used some of those techniques to explore de-biasing uh, prediction of grades based on race. Now, you do have to define what you mean by bias, right? All statistical models are bias. If you've ever fit a linear model that has an intercept, that's called bias, right? Um, so our definition, which is inherited from what kind of the field is converging on, is that the model not be differently performant by a sensitive attribute, right? So the accuracy on predicting Hispanics is the same thing as um, um, predicting blacks. So um, w doing that uh, tuning, we were able to even out the predictive performance. It does decrease the overall accuracy. So there are some difficult trade-offs when you're talking about fairness in, in AI. So it's a complex conversation, um, uh, but, but a necessary one. I guess finally, I would uh, leave you with, uh, we, we can't project uh, all of our societal ethical issues onto the AI. We have to figure them out ourselves. So you know, what does your institution value most is something you want to be clear on. And then you can see if the AI can be aligned with that, right? If it's not already, there are techniques to align it to that value system. So because bias and fairness and um, um, uh, these topics can be so contested, it's important to know that for yourself and then have the AI you know, adjust to you. Thank you. I appreciate the clarity around defining values, right? Thinking about what institutions really care about, what really matters, and kind of examining policies, practices, consequences, you know, both good and bad, kind of hinged upon those values. We have about 20 minutes left of our time together as a panel, so I do want to take a pause here and just see if there are any audience questions. Um, 
I'll just say, um, I think probably the best way to manage this is if you want to raise a hand and ask a question, you can address that question either to the full panel or to a particular panelist. Um, I don't know if, if we have mics anywhere else around the room. I, there's a handheld one we can kind of. There are mics around the room, so oh, great. Ask them to whoever is asking the question. And I have one up front here, too, that I think maybe works now. So, um, yes. Uh, Thank you, Igor. Thanks. No. I can also amplify, too, if we can't hear in the whole room. I'll, I'll make sure to repeat. some form, and I would decipher the difference between, say, graduate students and undergrads. I would love to throw in the mix of social media and uh, uh, also you know, the uses of technology in the classroom in some form, which I'm hoping we're kind of having a discussion of more integration of these questions into the Ciro, uh instrument. Uh, but if you were to ask, what would you want to know? You know, what would the questions be, uh, uh, two or three questions, graduate or undergraduate level? Well, I, I mean, certainly, so I'm the parent of two under, well, a recently graduated undergraduate and another undergraduate uh, currently in, in college. And I, I certainly want to know to the degree to which they are de using these technologies in their day-to-day -day experience in their, in their courses and then potentially separating out. And they may not even know, you mentioned, um, mental health and chatbots, they may not even know the degree to which they're using it there. But, but the, I'd be curious to, to how much they actually understand that that's what they're interacting with. Um, because I, I, you know, we, we do need to understand, are they, are they leaning on these to help them get through their coursework, um, both for undergraduates and I guess to graduate students. But I, I, I guess another experience, another question um, is to what degree are they consciously using it to teach themselves? Um, and and I you know I'll I'll use the I, I I said the example of the R code being written by ChatGPT that came straight from my daughter who was doing it in a statistics class and she was astounded that ChatGPT could correct her errors in her R code. Um, and uh, you know it, that that's going to become the norm, without a doubt, for something like that. Uh, well, I'm just uh, creating such sort of a, a questionnaire um, and to send it uh, out to uh, German universities. So um, um, if we have to reduce it to whatever two or three questions, I would definitely go to this sort of previous experience, then um, the experience currently in their subjects, so conscious and maybe unconsciously using AI systems in, in perspective of their uh, professors and classes. So what types? I mean, we've heard already about very different types from intelligent tutoring systems to, let's say, a general purpose AI. I call JetGP is just a general purpose one. So I would ask that. And then, of course, I would ask about their expectations and their ethical considerations um, about using that and um, how much uh, data they would provide the university, all safe and secure, um, in, in a way like a, a, a data donation to help their own learning experience. That would be a very, very interesting question. I don't have much to add. Um, I would echo what you say, but I would also be curious about their um, experience of using chatbots in a mental health context or other kind of in interrogatory, you know, kind of context where you need to ask, get information from something and how comfortable they are with that. To what extent do they know they have already been using it or would they be comfortable using it in the future? Uh, oh, one other question that occurred to me actually is that for the graduate students, how much how worried are you that these tutoring kind of systems are going to take away your teaching assistantships? <laughs> you know, because I think it, at least at, at UC we've had very high profile contract negotiations with these unions that are organizing teaching assistants and it's become quite, ex 
expensive. I mean, of course, I'm, I also understand the demands of the teaching assistants to have a fair and livable wage. Got it. Um, but then the the departments and the um, research lab managers are really struggling to find the money to, to pay them these wages. So then along comes chat GPT and these tutorial systems like, does that mean that we don't need as many teaching assistants as we did before? And I realize that this is completely verboten really to talk about, especially in your context, but I think that it's, if we're being realistic, we should think about it. And, and um, I'm sure people like on Zach's faculty are already thinking about it. It, uh, yeah, and actually we got a, a small grant to look into that sensitive topic um, in a limited way, which is uh, does deploying a, our open tutoring system in a, a large math class alleviate teaching assistant load? Right? So is there fewer office hours being taken advantage of when a student's using the tutoring system? Um, I think, you know, ideally we have all the we have more resources so that we can have that closer human contact, but I think it will reconfigure what TAs are, you know, used for versus the teacher. And I, I know students don't like to ask me programming questions, right? They want to ask their peers. Um, I don't know if they're embarrassed or they think it's not worth my time. Maybe they have those same concerns when talking to, you know, TAs and maybe they use. It's a very good question. I only add it before I hand the mic over is that. Where unionization comes into play, which is on the minds of particularly graduate uh, deans that are here, is significant. So this is going to be a very complex story. Cool. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Penpraise from Soka University. I just the the conversation here, which tilted towards TA, reminded me of a story I heard about uh, a, an artificial tutor, uh, artificial TA rather named Jill Watson that was deployed at Georgia State. And I remember the professor telling with glee how the students had no idea that this Jill Watson was a robot. In fact, Jill Watson even got nominated for best TA that semester. And I'm just wondering if there are stories of other cases like this where these robots have been turned loose on students, where students aren't aware that they're talking to robots. And, and what kinds of robots, what's the, what's the tension between making a realistic human-like bot that students can really feel comfortable interacting with and the idea that students' relationships with humans and machines begin to get blurred and confused? And what are some of the ethical implications of that? I think those are really interesting questions. I mean, I think many of us would probably err on the side of being transparent with students and saying, you know, we have this set of human teaching assistants who can offer this kind of assistance. We have also this online assistant who can give you perhaps other kinds of assistance. But I've been really fascinated by the research of, and Georgia Tech and some of the other Georgia institutions have been um, active in using, what's it called? Um, it used to be called Admit Hub. Mainstay is the organization, the commercial um, provider for some of these um, solutions. I've been so curious about how the students, even when they know that Bob the Bobcat, who's the mascot or whatever, that they're interacting with on their mobile phones is, is a bot, they establish these relationships with them. And I think that it would be a fascinating, you know, sociology dissertation or something about like, how are they relating to these automated um, personas? And that they had said, you know, in some cases, well, when I graduate, I'm really going to miss you, Bob, or, you know, whatever. So um, in some ways, it's sweet. In some ways, it's a little um, So yeah, I, I think it's an open question. Particularly at, at younger ages, right? Yeah. No, this is for college students, but yeah. yes, agree. And it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, you all maybe remember Eliza. Um, so the Josef Weizenbaum program, what is it, in the 60s or something, uh, that imitated a psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the interviewers uh, felt really happy um, mm -hmm. and, and understood. And this was a very, very simple, well, right. I wouldn't even call it an, well, at that time it might be an AI, I said whatever, but it was a very simple conversation tool and very e effective because we assign as human beings agency then to the machine. And that's sort of, and that's definitely that's not true. only one dissertation, yeah. but uh, several of those. So how do we do that and how will that change um, with AI? So particularly in communication, that's, that's sort of new. 
Um, so that will be definitely very interesting to see. Um, so um, I, I, I have a couple of different dimensions to my job. Of course, um, 6,000 graduate students, and they are concerned about TA ships and, and their ability to grade, but I also create new degrees. We have um, several degrees now that we offer on Coursera, which of course are effectively massive courses, thousands of students. And without having um, technology doing the grading for us, that wouldn't be, those, those degrees would not be possible. So there are many hundreds of people who are getting degrees data science, soon a computer science, a few other degrees in engineering, um, that, those degrees would not be possible if we didn't have technology doing the grading for us. So, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. That, that, it, I, I don't know that we would have, we would not have TAs for these classes because they're so huge. Um, but then again, we wouldn't be able to offer those degrees to the people who are getting them only through Coursera. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe one. Oh, we got, oh let's see if we can get to two more questions. So I know I've gone in the back and then one up here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ivor Emanuel. I'm the director of the Berkeley International Office. With an office that's serving thousands of students, we need to find ways of cutting our costs because uh, obviously it is hard to staff up when you've got thousands of students and each advisor in a place like Berkeley costs you well over 100000 in salary. So chat GPT, of course, is very intriguing for me. Is it inevitable that chat GPT is going to have access to students' private records? A student, for example, will come in and have a question about their immigration status. They just have to enter in their student ID and then have access to all that data. Is that inevitable? And are there situations where that information is not handled in the most ethical way? I would say uh, it's definitely not inevitable that uh, ChatGPT, without modification, will know any privileged information about the student in, in successive uh, versions. They're going to get less uh, open about where the data comes from, but it, it's mostly public data sources, I, right, as far as we know right now. What, what might be inevitable is um, using ChatGPT and providing it as what's called the prompt, the student's information, right? So that doesn't mean OpenAI has it necessarily, although you have to give it to it, sort of like a search query. So you can think of it as the, the, what you ask ChatGPT is the direct query, but then there's a context that you can add, right, which is all this information about their background. And I actually think that might, uh, I often am trying to uh, hire uh, international students after they graduate, and it is such a nightmare. It takes 50 email threads to get anything done. Uh, so I would love for ChatGPT to come around and, and, and help with that process. Yes, maybe one more comment, and then we'll take the last question. Uh, no, just a, a short answer. I mean, uh, um, if you look at Europe, there is uh, the GDPR um, regulations, and that's just illegal. Um, that wouldn't work, um, even if you, even if it's on your side. If you have anything from the prompt of your Chat GBT running in in the system from Europe to the US, that's your Patriot Act. We're not allowed to do it. Um, but, so for Europe, that's very clear. And maybe you could copy some of it because I think the ethical considerations is quite good. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's take our final question over here. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, very thoughtful ideas. Uh, so my question is, uh, we have experienced uh, a significant uh, declining trend in survey response rates. Uh, is there anything based on AI we could use, or if you have any thoughts uh, we could use to uh, help uh, encourage students uh, to participate in surveys and uh, for our uh, marketing strategies. Thank you. I have no suggestions. Amazon gift cards. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think you could potentially use it for, um, you know, researching effective communication strategies. Um, someone besides me would have to come up with those <laughs> ideas, but uh, certainly having a resource like that where you could draw on, like, at least to generate ideas, and this is more broadly than just marketing, but like, give me 10 ideas for a birthday gift for my boyfriend who likes X, Y, and Z. Give me 10 headlines for this story, here's the lead paragraph. Give me, you know, like you can use it for idea generation and maybe only two of the 10 that you get back are any good at all, but then that gives you something to go on that you didn't have before. That doesn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think, Testing questions certainly would be something yeah. we would easily be able to do. And also, I wasn't here earlier for the business meeting, but I know there was a lot of discussion of response rates. Um, we, our office had to field many, many questions, basic questions about our last administration of CIRU, uh, grad CIRU. And uh, certainly having a chat bot that was fielding those questions could have gotten them, res gotten the students' responses much quicker than what we did. and potentially more accurate, um, but, also, but also just simply fielding those questions that students had about the survey. Um, I think that would be quite useful and, and would cut down on a lot of interactions with folks who have other things that they need to be doing rather than responding to those. So yeah, just a simple chat bot. I just, I, that's probably an area where the, the vendors are the experts, mm -hmm. you know, at that sales force and, and all that and personalized marketing, which is kind of scary, personalized marketing with ChatGPT, where you don't know if you're talking to a human or not. But. Well, we've got just a couple minutes at the end here, and I was hoping we could end this with a little bit of a flash round uh, for each panelist just to share uh, a parting resource or reading that they think uh, this group would benefit from. So maybe let's go down the row and we can have each panelist to share a resource that they'd like people to explore after the panel's over. I'm not sure I have a good resource for folks. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I have two resources. One, read the GDPR. Mm. Um, it's really um, uh, brilliant. Um, um, and it, was, uh, a long, it took a long time to do that. And e uh, the EU is currently working on an AI act which is also very interesting to see. Also the process of getting there, not, not the piece of law. I'm not a legal expert, but just the process. And the second is we've developed in this European context a framework which is called SHELA, um, S-H-E-I-L-A. You might look it up. That's for engagement strategies and how to bring um, most stakeholders on board. Great. Thank you. So I have two. Um, one you might have come across already. It was put out recently by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, it's a report called Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Teaching and Learning. So I thought that sounded on point. Uh, the URL is um, tech.ed.gov slash AI. So that, I think, would be worth taking a look at. And the other is kind of fun, the Hard Fork podcast. I don't know if any of you listen to this. It's from the New York Times. Kevin Roos is a New York Times tech reporter and another fellow um, have this weekly podcast called Hard Fork. And I was actually inspired about the promise of generative AI by an episode probably two, three months ago. Um, so anyway, they have conversations about what's new in technology, including in AI often. Um, but they're an entertaining pair, and I would recommend it. And I'll also suggest, too, um, I've referenced uh, doing an experiment with a tutoring system, and uh, that tutoring system uh, is the, the first open sourcing of an intelligent tutoring system that we, uh, that's been out in the field. It's oatutor.io uh, for openadaptivetutor.io, so completely MIT licensed corporations. Anyone can fork it, use it, very low resource to deploy, can be deployed on GitHub uh, with a number of clicks. Um, so no gatekeeping from us and how you want to use that or do research with it. Uh, the second thing is if you want to track uh, the lab's uh, research on uh, algorithmic articulation and other AI uh, transfer solutions, uh, go to askoski.com, A-S-K-O-S-K-I.com, and then there's a thing that says based on data science research, and then you'll see all our publications and good stuff. All right, well, thank you. Can we give a round of applause to all of our finalists, or panelists, excuse me. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I know there were more questions, so I'm sure those can be engaged over coffee and throughout the symposium. So thank you again for your time and attention today. Yeah, thank you so much.